So I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Steve Blake, who uh, has two doctorates uh, in natural health and uh, has a master herbalist degree, I believe, and has uh, written um, uh, over a dozen publications. And what am I forgetting? Oh, yeah, um, he has, he's, he's developed some software um, that can help you um, analyze your diet better. So, and he's from Hawaii. Steve Blake. Here, how am I coming in? Are you seeing any sound over there? Good. Good. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. It's really nice to be up here. I'm from San Francisco, but my wife and I live on an organic farm on Maui. And on our organic farm, we take in and rescue animals. And uh, we've done quite a lot with taking animals that were really miserable, like these poor egg-laying chickens. And we went into these places that, you know, would really make a concentration camp look like a resort, um, and pulled out the chickens and brought them to our farm. And it was really nice to see these chickens. They had never seen the sun in their entire life, never spread their wings because their cages are so small. And uh, it was, they were really dirty. And they came out to be really nice, fluffy, white, beautiful, happy birds. They didn't even know how to scratch. If you're familiar with chickens, you know, they spend all day kind of scratching and pecking. These guys didn't even know how to scratch. It was pretty amazing. So yeah, I, um, I write a lot of books about health, and I study health. And my specialty is nutritional biochemistry. So I study and teach about the little things in food, and tonight I'm going to talk about vitamins and minerals. Together, vitamins and minerals are called micronutrients. And these micronutrients are really important. I uh, can't emphasize that. If you, for instance, didn't want to get colds or flu or cancer, then micronutrition is definitely something to watch out for. Uh, if you want more energy, you can't really make energy without vitamins especially, and minerals, because the minerals are cofactors to the enzymatic forms of the vitamins. So you really need it. I know a lot of doctors say if you want to lose weight, just eat fewer calories than you burn, but it doesn't work. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Reverse lightning. Uh, it doesn't work because people can't burn their fat because they're not getting the vitamins and minerals needed to burn their fat. So. A lot of us are starting to think about strong bones, and if you're still young and have strong bones, well, remember, that's when your bones get strong. And after maybe 25, your bones are progressively getting just a little tiny bit weaker. So if you're young, keep making them strong, and if you're older, then you need to watch out. And I'll talk not just about calcium, but vitamin K, vitamin D, and magnesium, some of the other things that make bones strong besides, <laughs> and no, you don't need milk to make strong. By the way, I had my bone density checked uh, less than a week ago, and I've been a vegetarian vegan for 40 years, and uh, it was right at the top of the chart, strong. I hadn't had any milk in decades and decades. So yes, it is, it is possible. Uh, if you're going to be pregnant, you should start thinking about micronutrition, and if you are pregnant or nursing, it's really important that you be nourished properly for that, so keep that in mind. The biggest killer of Americans is heart disease, and about three quarters of a million people, about one every 30 seconds, gets a heart attack, and there's probably three million small heart attacks in addition. Heart attacks are preventable. So is diabetes, so is cancer, so are colds and flu. Uh, so this is highly related to vitamins and minerals in the diet. In 2008, I wrote this book that you see on the screen. I'm sorry I only have one tonight, so one lucky person can get one at the end of the night. Um, for McGraw-Hill, I wrote an undergraduate textbook on vitamins and minerals, and this talk is largely based on the research I did for this book. <coughs> so, hey, that worked. So here is human nutrition in a nutshell. We need the big nutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And each of those could be a whole. Carbohydrates, it's real simple. Don't eat white flour things because they're depleted of their vitamins and minerals. I'll talk more about that as we go on. With fats, it's really better that you don't eat animal fats or coconut oil-based fats. If you don't, then your saturated fats will be low, and this means that your blood cholesterol will be low. And 
one person in this room, who I won't mention, has one of the lowest blood cholesterols I've ever seen, extremely excellent, because he's a vegan. His blood cholesterol is low, and that means his chances of having a heart attack are less than his chances of getting struck by lightning. You just can't do it unless your arteries are clogged up. And the blood cholesterol is an indication of how clogged up your arteries are. Now, protein is really interesting. Just last night in San Jose, I was giving a talk, and people said, where do you get your protein? And constantly I'm asked this. And, uh, you know, it comes from pretty much all of the foods that I eat. And I have this program. I've been working on this for about 10 years, the, uh, the Diet Doctor. And it's software that you put in your computer, and you pick out what you ate in a day, and it shows you with 46 color charts, just what you got in that day in the way of nutrition. Nutrients are invisible. You can't see protein in food. And a lot of times when people say, I feel like protein, they're really craving fat, not protein. It's, it's hard to say. In all of the diets I've analyzed, only one came up short of protein. And on Maui, we have fruitarians, live food Aryans, and every other area you can possibly imagine. Uh, all the way from you know lumberjacks to hippies who live in tree houses. None of them came up short on protein except this one lady who was starving. And she was 80 pounds, poor dear, and getting only half the calories she needed. And uh, I made the obvious recommendation she should eat more. Um, and she did, and she's doing fine. So low protein is not a problem, but tonight I'll talk about high protein and how that can leach calcium out of your bones. And high protein is very, very common. For instance, I'm a vegan and I get an average of 83 grams a day. Now, we're all supposed to get something like 46 to 56 grams a day, and I'm already getting 83. If I ate any meat, it would be 183. So you can see that protein is kind of the reverse way that you thought of it. And I just want to emphasize that everyone who's ever said that low protein is a problem <coughs> has either not studied nutrition or worked for the Beef and Dairy Council. So other than that, uh, anyone who's really looked into it, you'll see that nutrition for protein is not a problem. Okay, then there are the vitamins and minerals. Vitamins and essential minerals are needed for life, and they're the ones we can't make in our body. So I'll go over those. We also need water and air and love. Love's very important. We need not only to get love, but we need to give love. And giving love to animals is something that I think is really an important nourishment for our souls. Also giving love to plants and the trees around us. And of course, people too. There, so now we have complete nutrition. Yeah. Have to round it out. So the vitamins, you know, here are the B vitamins, and there are eight of them down here. These are the ones that have been decided on by the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine, which is a medical board that tries to determine what people need in the way of nutrition, and they define what is and isn't a vitamin. For instance, this vitamin D down here doesn't meet the requirements to be a vitamin. A vitamin is something that's essential for life, and vitamin D is, and you can't make in the body. But we all make vitamin D in our bodies. And many of us who get a little sunlight make plenty of vitamin D in our bodies. So they didn't do it perfectly there. There may be some other substances, and in my book I've got a chapter called Wanna B Vitamins. And these are some substances like alpha lipoic acid or choline that perhaps should be defined and perhaps will be defined as essential later on when they finally make up their minds. There's also some minerals that um, we need perhaps for brain function that they haven't defined as essential. Pretty much I'm going to stick to the ones defined as essential. There's plenty of them to go around. Um, <clears throat> in our bodies, if you kind of look and see what's in a human body, there's about one kilogram, 2.2 pounds of calcium. Calcium's the biggest mineral in our body, mostly in bones, but it, well, calcium's really important. And you can't test calcium with a blood test because our blood always has the same amount of calcium. This is because our muscles have calcium channels. And in order for a muscle to contract, it has to be able to take in calcium from a right bloodstream in order to contract. Does anyone know the mineral needed in order to relax our muscles? Magnesium. Yeah, that's the one we need to relax our muscles. And magnesium is often low in diets. One diet I found really low, and it was the Atkins diet. 
And a standard American diet is typically low. If you don't eat a lot of greens, it'll probably be low in your diet. And magnesium is very, very important. Then there are the electrolyte minerals. We've all heard of electrolyte drinks and electrolyte minerals. So those are sodium, potassium, and chloride. Those are the three that we lose when we sweat and that need to be replaced if we're sweating heavily. In the tropics, it's really important. Here, I noticed that it's too cold to sweat most of the time. But Sebastopol does get hot, doesn't it? So um, that's nice. So then there's a few little ones like magnesium. We just have a little in the body. And then there are the trace minerals. Here are some trace minerals for you. Um, there are iron. Now, iron deficiency is the commonest nu nutrient deficiency in the world, with over a billion people being iron deficient. But iron deficiency doesn't really apply after age 50. It applies especially to growing children and most especially to pregnant women. And so those are the times you need to be especially careful about iron. Other trace minerals, now you see this, this chart is one tenth as big as the other chart. We need less of the trace minerals, but we need them just as much. Doesn't mean we need them less, it just means we need less of them. Zinc, really important for the immune system. You have to have zinc also for antioxidant protection. We have free radicals in our body called superoxide. Superoxide are usually made by accidents when we make energy in the mitochondria of our cells. And this superoxide has to be neutralized by an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. And it won't be a quiz. I'm just mentioning this kind of briefly. And that one needs zinc. It also needs manganese and copper. So those are the three minerals that support our antioxidant status. Antioxidants are really important if you don't, for instance, want to get cancer or heart disease. Then you want to make sure the endogenous antioxidants are the ones we make inside our bodies. And if you want to make your own antioxidants, you had better make sure you get these in your diet somehow along the way. This is a waterfall pool we call Flat Rock Pool. And it's right next to where we live. And it just makes kind of a nice eye break, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so now I'll talk about vitamin C and uh, how it works with colds. Now, Linus Pauling wrote a book called Vitamin C in the Common Cold. It was very controversial because what he said was that if you took vitamin C, your colds would be less trouble. He even said you would get fewer colds. And because he won two Nobel Prizes, he was really hard to ignore. It turns out that maybe you can't keep colds away with taking vitamin C. You certainly can keep colds away by becoming a whole food vegan. Whole food vegans tend to get colds very, very rarely. Uh, for instance, maybe once every year or two or five. And non-vegans tend to get colds maybe three to five times a year. Depends on your health and many other factors. But you know, you want to maybe reconsider the whole germ theory thing, which really doesn't work that well. Because if you think about it, if one person in this room was really had a bad cold and was coughing out this cloud of these cold viruses, would everyone in the room be exposed? Yes. Would everyone in the room get a cold? No. Only one or two people might get a cold. And why? Because they're susceptible. So I look more at the susceptibility to disease for infectious disease than I do at exposure to germs. It's fine to wash your hands and all that stuff. That's all good. But susceptibility is really the key. Now, vitamin C is needed during colds, and the antihistamine effect is really nice. Histamine is released during any inflammation. It's often released into the nasal passages in the throat, causing a lot of discomfort. So vitamin C shrinks your nasal passages and allows you to breathe a little easier. That's pretty nice. Vitamin C is used in phagocytes and leukocytes. These are immune system cells that are really important in curing the cold. So that's, that's pretty good too. Now, <clears throat> when a phagocyte wants to destroy a pathogen, the bullets it uses are what? What does it use as bullets? Free radicals. You use free radicals as bullets to destroy pathogens. Vitamin C scavenges up those bullets so they don't hurt our own cells. That's really nice too. Vitamin C increases the production of interferon. I've got a 30-page chapter on vitamin C in Vitamins and Minerals Demystified, so clearly it does a lot more than this. One of the best things about vitamin C intake during a cold is that it's not likely to progress into pneumonia. And pneumonia is what kills most elderly people. 
So, and of course, nobody wants their cold to progress into bronchitis or pneumonia. So adequate vitamin C is a really good idea. So that was your advertisement for vitamin C. Now, here's where it comes from. And these charts I generated using the diet doctor. The diet doctor is based on the USDA food composition tables. And I was lucky enough to download them just two weeks ago when they got released at the end of September. So it's really fresh data. Uh, and fresh fruits are the key. So fresh is the word. Um, where do you get them? Okay, here's meats down here. How much vitamin C in meats? Exactly zero. Well, what about in all these other protein foods? Nope, sorry. What about whole grains? Nope, at all. Fruits and vegetables. If you want vitamin C, you're going to have to eat fruits and vegetables. Oh, tough. But they're really good, and they're really good for you, and they're abundant. And here in America, they're cheap, all year long, easy to get. This is not true in other countries. Some places, it's really hard to get year-long fruits and vegetables. So that's where you get C. Now, orange is one. That's not surprising at all. And this is strawberries. They did really well. Broccoli did really well in C. Did anyone know that broccoli had a lot of vitamin C? I mean, we're all told that it's good for us, but there's something you might not have known. Now, I want to switch over to vitamin A, and this is now an advertisement for vitamin A. Um, I'm not selling any products, okay, and um, I really, my only interest is your health. Uh, I'd be happy to sell books or things like that, but I, I'm just joking about the advertisement thing here. Now, vitamin A strengthens our mucous membranes and increases the secretion. This is a good thing because our mucous membranes and our skin are both are barriers to the outside world. And medically speaking, inside of our trachea in our stomach, our whole digestive system is called outside the body because that's where pathogens exist from the external world. And it is our mucous membranes that protect us, and also the sinuses have mucous membranes and our lungs that protect us. If these mucous membranes are healthy, they will protect us from all types of infections. If they're not, they won't. So vitamin A is crucial in keeping this mucus protection. Now, what type of food could you eat in order to really mess up your mucous membranes and really ruin their ability? Now, mucus is supposed to be a very thin, almost water-like fluid that the little hair-like cilia in the lungs, for instance, move any atmospheric dust or any germ viruses, they, they move it out and it's eliminated, say, from the lungs. Now, what could you do to really mess that up? Products. Milk, dairy products, yes, cheese would be perfect. <laughs> what happens with dairy products is that your mucus thickens. And, um, you know, the new bumper sticker would be got snot. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, dairy products thicken the mucus into a sludgy stuff. So when the atmospheric pollutants and when the pathogens get stuck in it, the body can't easily eliminate them. So we have periodic explosions of eliminations that are called a cold. Keeps the skin flexible, makes you beautiful. Vitamin A is a good thing. Um, it's needed in the development of blood cells. Um, these are immune system blood cells. Um, it's also needed for regulation of the T lymphocytes. We've all heard of T lymphocytes. They're the ones that learn about pathogens and then go after the ones they learn about. Uh, I get, gave a talk on diabetes a week or so ago in a hospital, and it was on adult type 2 diabetes. But I researched recently child onset diabetes, and I think it's fascinating that it seems to be related to the fact that mothers, when they stop breastfeeding early, like three to six months, and put their kids on cow's milk, some of the beta casein, the protein in cow's milk, leaks out of the intestines in susceptible babies, and the T lymphocytes learn that that's a pathogen, and then go in and attack the beta cells in the pancreas, thus killing off the insulin-producing cells in the baby and creating really a terrible disease. So this is some things about dairy products somehow got worked into vitamin A. I don't know how that happened. Um, zinc's also essential for T lymphocyte function. So where do you get vitamin A? Again, if we look carefully at the meats, pretty much nothing, proteins, and fruits have some, and it varies. Uh, and again, grains, not a good source. Fruits and vegetables, again, if the vegetable or fruit is yellow or orange, it's got a lot of beta carotene in it. If it's green, it still has a lot of beta carotene, but the beta carotene color is masked by the denser pigment of chlorophyll. 
So greens are also always high in beta carotene. There are other carotenes. There's alpha carotene, there's lycopenes, there's xanthines. There's all kinds of other plant antioxidant bioflavonoids out there besides beta carotene. But this is the one that we kind of gauge the goodness of a food. and It works pretty well. Now, there are five different forms of vitamin A. The bottom line is only beta carotene is the antioxidant form. None of the other forms have any antioxidant activity. They're useful. Uh, healthy skin is retinols domain. Retinol is used in the rod cells. We've all heard of vitamin A in night vision. Rod cells are on night vision. And retinoic acid is used in cell differentiation and is very important in, for instance, preventing cancer. So here, right here, is a fun little drawing of beta carotene. I drew all these. I really enjoy drawing these things. And here are some other forms of vitamin A. Now, what you notice is that if you cut it in half right here, you can get the retinal form of vitamin A. So each beta carotene, you can form two vitamin A's out of. Most people in the world get most of their vitamin A from beta carotene. And you should get all of your vitamin A from beta carotene. The other form of, of um, let's see, go back. The other form of vitamin A, the, the preformed forms, um, retinol, palmitate, or other esters, those are found in animal products. Cod liver oil or beef liver or things like that. This form of vitamin A is potentially toxic. It has been proven to cause birth defects in women, and it definitely contributes to osteoporosis in the elderly. And it's not healthy for anybody at all. It's a bad idea to take this form. Whether it's in a capsule or it's added to milk, it's still not a good idea to take this preformed type of vitamin A. And I, my recommendation would be zero in that form at all. Any, any of them, retinol, retinal, retinol palmitate, or retinol esters. Just skip those and eat the delicious pumpkins and papayas and all those wonderful foods that we have, green vegetables. Now, I want to mention some things about older people briefly. Um, if you're not old already, you probably have parents or grandparents who this will apply to. And thiamine deficiency is often a problem with elderly people. So they need to somehow get enough B vitamins, and I'm going to cover sources for those things. Also, there's, uh, you need three things to get rid of. Has anyone heard of homocysteine in this group? Okay, homocysteine is a blood chemical that's also an indicator of heart disease, and we would like that to be lower, and especially for older folks, they want it to be lower. Well, there's a nice biochemical pathway for our bodies to get rid of homocysteine and turn it either into cysteine or methionine. For that you need folate. Folate is named after green foliage and you get it from green foliage. Uh, let's see, what else do you need? Vitamin B6 and B12 are needed. Now strict vegetarians don't get any B12 in their diet so that could be a problem. So strict vegetarians should take B12 from some source either from sublingual tablets or nutritional yeast or fortified food. You have to have it. Um, elderly are also often low in uh, vitamin D. And that's because we're all told to avoid the sun. And elderly people may be institutionalized. If you know some of your parents or grandparents are institutionalized, they may not get enough vitamin D. It's crucial that you get vitamin D. So if you're not getting sun or sunblock, if you smear on sunblock every time you get in the sun, it blocks the production of vitamin D. So you're not making it that way. So then you'd need to supplement your vitamin D there. Uh, sodium should be restricted a little more in the elderly than in the regular population. 3,500 milligrams for most folks and 3,000 for the elderly. And also, their absorption of magnesium may be lower. Magnesium, remember, is the muscle relaxant. And magnesium is really important for everything, including healthy bones, really an important thing. And zinc has come up about three times now as being an important nutrient. What are good sources of zinc? Nuts and seeds, good sources of zinc. Okay, so I want to talk about these energy producing things. We all need energy to think, to talk, to run, to do everything. Vitamin B1 is like the carbo burner, and I'll show you how that works. Vitamin B2 is like the fat burner. It helps us to burn fat. Niacin helps to create energy all over the place. 
Vitamin B5, pantothenic acid, really is the center of energy production, also depleted in white flour. And B6 is a protein burner, helps us to burn. If you want to look like this guy, you better get your B vitamins, or you're never going to keep up with them. Let's see here. Um, so if you want to lose weight, you need the vitamins and minerals to do it. And if you eat a typical American diet, you're going to be fat, tired, and hungry. I mean, we've all gone to Costco and seen the people who are fat, tired, and hungry, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you got to make energy, you got to burn energy, you have to eat energy in order to do it. And um, this is a little diagram that I drew of energy production in the cell. You start out with either carbohydrates, protein, or fat. And these are all translated into acetyl coenzyme A. Sorry, it's a big word. There isn't another word for it. But coenzyme A is half pantothenic acid. That's the B5 I was just talking about. And then they have this cycle, which used to be called the Krebs cycle. Has anyone ever heard of the Krebs cycle? Yeah, that's because you're older. Now it's called, they changed the name and simplified it to the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Isn't that nice of them? For all the newer students, anyone heard of the TCA cycle? Okay, you'll get to it. Just, you know, it'll be a little while till you get there in biochemistry. Anyway, we make energy in this cycle and it pumps up through an electron transport chain our energy. We start with adenosine monophosphate, there's one phosphate, becomes pumped up to adenosine diphosphate and pumped up further to adenosine triphosphate, which is a fully charged battery that's used all throughout our body to create energy. In order to do this, we need the B vitamins. Like here's B1. B1 helps take the carbohydrates, which are usually stored in the form of glycogen, which is broken down into glucose, and then further broken down into pyruvate, and then it moves into the center of energy here and is burned for energy. So if you want to run, you're going to need to have B1. Now here's an interesting thing. In flour, they take the B1 out when they grind it. The B1's in the outer part, the germ and the husk of the wheat kernel. So they remove the B1, but then they add it back in, in a synthetic form, which may not be too good. It's either made by coal tar or made with genetically recombinant bacteria. But that's not even the problem. The problem is it take, requires magnesium in order to activate B1. Without magnesium, you can't activate it into the only form that actually does anything in your body, and they take 83%, 86% of the magnesium out of the white flour when they process it. And they, then they call this enriched flour. So if you're eating enriched flour, you're not going to be getting the vitamin B1 that is commonly found in whole grains. Whole grains is a really good thing. Here's some idea of where you get B1. And sunflower seeds won this chart. By the way, I did I think 21 of these charts for my book. And spinach won, hands down, Popeye was right. <laughs> and then sunflower seeds won a very close second. And nothing else really came in as good as, as whole leafy greens and nuts and seeds. Really our dynamic powerhouse of micronutrition. Uh, soy, soy milk or acorn squash, pistachio nuts, fortified foods, green peas and watermelon. Those are some sources. As you can see it's widely available and most people aren't deficient unless they eat a lot of white flour, which means most Americans. Now here's B2 and you see that fat needs B2 in order to be processed in and become energy. So if your B2 is low, you're not going to be able to produce energy and you get tired easily. Spinach this one as well. And you'll see that B2 is found all throughout the different food groups. It's really not that hard to get. Broccoli and chard, asparagus are rich sources of B2, which is riboflavin. Now, if you take riboflavin in a supplement form, it's almost surely produced with recombinant bacteria, genetically modified bacteria that produce at a very cheap rate lots of B2. But this could be a problem because that we've had problems with tryptophan. Bacteria produced tryptophan and put a toxin in that killed a lot of people and crippled a lot more. This also could be true of the B2 that's made by these bacteria. So you might want to watch out sources if you're going to take vitamin pills. Uh, you can get it in food, no problem, if you're eating healthy food. Now here's niacin, and look at this. I think it's kind of amazing, everywhere. It's all over the place. 
the enzymatic form of niacin is absolutely essential for the production of energy. It prepares everything, and so I call it the energy creator. And it's found in lots of foods. Now, niacin is found in meat products, and it's also found in other protein like peanut butter and sunflower seeds are really rich sources. Um, niacin is made from tryptophan in the body. And when you want to see the niacin content of a diet, you really need to look also at the tryptophan content of the diet. Many people get more niacin from the tryptophan they take in than they do from the niacin they take in. So it's kind of one of those interesting ones. Anyway, I think it's fun. Here's B5, and you can see that it's the center of energy. Nothing happens without it. B5 is taken out of white flour and white rice when it's milled, but it's not put back in. And uh, you can see B5 is available widely. Sunflower seeds, again, are winning it. You're kind of getting maybe the message here tonight is eat your nuts and seeds and your greens. And if that's all you got out of this talk tonight, I think it would really improve your health. Uh, this one is B6. And it in, is involved, yes, in carbohydrate preparation for burning and also in protein preparation for burning. It, it also allows you to change your different amino acids into other amino acids. It's kind of the alchemy of the body here. So, yes, consume time. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if anyone has a question, I love being interrupted, so go ahead, get lively. Yes? Um, I see spinach is a list of everything, but it says cooked spinach. So yeah. Raw spinach is not as nutritional for you? You know, it's fine either way. Um, for this chart, I use cooked spinach because most people eat cooked spinach rather than raw. And it's not just spinach, it's any leafy green. You know, kale, collards, any leafy gr dark green that you have. Raw is fine. Raw is fine and cooked is fine, but you can eat only this much raw spinach, but you can eat this much spinach when it's cooked. So because you can eat so much more cooked spinach, you really wind up getting a lot more nutrition, even though some of these things are depleted by heat. For instance, vitamin B2 is not depleted by heat at all, but it can be leached out. All of these are water soluble, so they can all be leached out. If you're gonna like boil your vegetables and throw away the water, then you're gonna eliminate most of the B vitamins. Yes? Uh, does it produce its vitamins after a certain It really varies vitamin by vitamin, mm -hmm. and I have cute little charts in my book on what depletes vitamins. Sometimes light does, like B2 is depleted by light rather than heat, but mostly look for depletion by leaching. And that's where you get boiling. You know, if you make a soup or a stew, then it stays in there and you get it all. If you steam, you lose a little bit. Um, by leaching, you can see the water's green when you're done, so some of it's gone in there. Um, but if you boil it and throw away the water, which I don't think anybody does anymore, uh, then you'd lose the most if that was your goal. Yes, wait. Um, can you go back to B12 for a second and mention why it is that uh, our diets are deficient? Because I know it's something about the... Yeah, except it's not back, it's coming. Oh, okay. I thought We're progressing okay. up the numbers. Um, I, I just have a question about enzymatic <coughs> niacin. How does that compare to flushable niacin? Well, there's two forms of niacin, niacinamide and, well, niacin. And niacin, if you take it in a pill form, produces a flush and also is used to thin the blood for heart patients. Mm -hmm. And if you take niacinamide, it doesn't create a flush, so, but it still provides all of these services for your body. They're interconvertible in the body. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just if you want the rush of a flush, then you can eat the niacin and otherwise not. Were you saying that all multivitamins have sources of, of B vitamins that come from recombinant bacteria and therefore are potentially dangerous? Gee, that's tough. Do they all? You know, I, I've developed vitamins. I work for Rainbow Light uh, Nutrition in Santa Cruz, and I developed a multiple vitamin for them and some others. And I also developed a spectrum line of vitamins. And it's, uh, there's a lot of, hocus pocus going on in the vitamin industry with that. So normally they're either made from coal tar through a synthesis process or by bacteria. And the bacteria typically are refined by genetic manipulations for profit. Uh, if not, then they might be food grown. And food grown means that you take something like uh, yeast or a spirulina 
and you take one gram of yeast and you put in one gram of B vitamins and supposedly they're supposed to process it into a complex form but in reality they instantly die and it's really just the same old coal tar or bacteria produced vitamins anyway. Um, yeah, it's really hard to find a good B vitamin. It really is. Even nutritionally fortified yeast is fortified with factory made B vitamins. That's where they come from and they add it to the yeast. They add less so the yeast is still living and I think it's a much better kind of organic process to get it in there. You should really get your B vitamins from food. I mean that would be ideal. Then I guess the question is how, what is the potential danger of just having a multivitamin and having these genetically? Um, I don't think there's a lot of danger frankly. Um, yeah. I mean, because you said something ominous about people dying. Right. With tryptophan, triple, like the, tryptophan the, yeah. the, the recombinant bacteria caused a toxin to be introduced at very low levels that was extremely potent. This could happen again. And the industry isn't looking for it. So when a bunch of people die, well, I'll hear about it. Until then, no one will know. Um, I'm not too scared about taking B vitamins in a multiple or something. It's not a real scary thing. But relying on supplements for your nutrition is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about relying on food for your nutrition. And, you know, maybe you can add some B vitamins, but I'd want you to get most of them from your food. So greens and beans and nuts and seeds and fruits and vegetables, those would be good sources. Um, vitamins lost in white flour. Much of the B1, B2, B3, B6 and pantothenic acid they add back this synthetic, very cheap, poorly absorbable B1, B2, and B3, and then they can call it enriched. 43% of the pantothenic acid and 13% of the B6 remain in the flour. So, does anyone here not eat white flour products? Hey, that's pretty good. Wow, good job. They're hard to avoid. I mean, I go to grocery stores and go down the lane reading those bread labels with the brown print on the brown paper, you know, and try and make it out. And, you know, on the front it says whole grain bread. And on the back it says enriched wheat flour or just wheat flour, which means white flour. So you really have to be very cautious in order to find anything. Costco has one loaf of bread that's actually whole grain. And it's the Kirkland brand one. Um, but in some stores, which I won't mention by brand name, there aren't any. Trader Joe's has one, and it's actually their own brand name, too. It's kind of interesting. Um, so white flour is not such a good thing. Um, not only are they depleted during the grinding of the flour when they remove the good part, but also processing, storage, more of these nutrients are depleted. So my message here on white flour is avoid it whenever possible. It's also quite a risk factor for diabetes. It's also quite a risk factor for obesity. And it's a big risk factor for just plain feeling tired. So forget it. White flour is no fun. Um, pantothenic acid and B6, you can see all of the various ways that these are used in here. If you're low in them, you're not going to produce energy. You're not going to jump up and down and feel good. So we'll talk a little bit about magnesium. Um, magnesium is the one that if you're getting B1, but you can't get enough magnesium because 86% is removed from white flour and you're eating white flour product, then your B1 won't do anything. You won't get energy from it. You won't be able to burn carbohydrates at all. Um, that, what is it? 76% is removed in whole wheat and rice is 70% is removed. So magnesium is largely removed. If you take a typical American diet, I call it a standard American diet, which is abbreviated SAD. And <laughs> you look at it, you'll see the magnesium content's very, very low. And maybe some of the spastic driving is due to people who are low in magnesium. I don't know. But I'm really impressed coming from Maui where our fastest road is like 40 miles an hour in two lanes. And today, we were, I think we had five lanes coming up here. It was quite amazing. And they were all full of really spastic people. <laughs> really fun. So where is it found? Spinach won again. Yet again, spinach won the, the feet. Uh, magnesium's not too hard to get if you're eating a whole food diet, but if you're eating processed foods, like, you know, packaged foods, cookies, cakes, crackers, pretty much the stuff that comes in packages and tastes really good and is really bad for you, that stuff's low in magnesium. 
Yes. Does it charge the reflect availability or just like content of magnesium storage? Well, that's a really good question. Um, are we looking at the availability or the content? Well, each of the minerals has a typical absorption that, and the Food Nutrition Board really goes into this. They have like 100 plus page monographs in very technical language looking at how people absorb each of these minerals. So they have one on magnesium that I've read through several times. And they really do look at the variation in absorption. So for infants, they'll have a different RDA than for toddlers, and different ones for teenagers than they do for adults. So they're really looking at absorption. And women and men have different absorption of these nutrients in some cases. So this is taken into account in the RDAs. So for instance, if you analyzed your diet and used the RDA for your age and sex, then you would find a representative amount. Now, nutrition varies dramatically between people, adequate nutrition. Roger Williams wrote a book called Nutritional Biochemistry, or, no, Biochemical Individuality, that's it. And in this book, it was amazing, I had it in college, and he showed actual autopsy pictures of the insides of people, and they were totally different. Like, you know, the aorta is supposed to be a little thing like this with three little blips coming off. Well, some people had 20 branches coming off, some had one. The colon's supposed to go like this, but some people, it just went all over the place, and others, it went straight across. Inside, we are as different as we are on the outside. So our nutritional needs, our biochemical needs are also different. So different people have different ability to absorb the different minerals. Now, mineral absorption is highly dependent upon hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So if you're super stressed out all the time and your hydrochloric acid is suppressed, you're not going to be able to absorb your minerals nearly as well as if you are relaxed. And there's lots of other factors on how you can get enough digestion potential to do it. But so the amounts that I'm looking at are really, I mean, this is how much is actually in spinach when they test it at the USDA food composition database labs. And that's how much is in the food. The RDAs take into account absorption and age and so on. So yeah, that was a good question. Here's how magnesium stabilizes an ATP. This is what makes everything possible in life, is this energy battery. There's three phosphates, so it's fully charged. But without magnesium, you can't keep the charge. You know, it's like those batteries that just keep dying when you put them on a shelf and you take them out and they're dead. But it's the same way. People just can't hold their energy charge. So even if you're pumping up your energy, you need magnesium. Uh, so we'll look a little bit about other minerals needed for energy production. Now, each cell creates energy. And we do it in the mitochondria, the little energy factories in our cell. But our body cells are all controlled by our thyroid gland, which is up here. And the thyroid gland tells the cells rev up and make more energy or slow down we're going to go to sleep soon so the thyroid gland is in charge of metabolism it boosts your energy or it lowers your energy and the main thyroid hormone is normally known as thyroxine and thyroxine is one that doctors will look for in your blood and one that they may supplement for you externally but thyroxine doesn't do anything in the body it has to be converted and to do this conversion you need selenium and it's converted into a, another simple name, triiodothyronine. And in this form, it's able to rev up your whole body and give you the energy you need to just have an excellent life. And without selenium, no. Now, selenium's really easy to get in sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, whole brown ones are best, and um, Brazil nuts are another good, very famous source of that. Now, we need iron, sulfur, and copper in order to make energy in the electron chain. You know, I don't want to get complicated about this, but um, iron's really an important one for younger people, and iron is something you want to avoid if you're older. Um, there's a problem with excess iron in folks who are older 50 and deficient iron in folks who are under 50. So um, nickel is really interesting because you need it to make energy too. And nickel isn't really defined as an essential nutrient yet. Uh, maybe one day. White flour losses, half the selenium, 62% of the copper, and most of the potassium. What about iodine sources if you don't eat a lot of iodine? If you don't eat iodized salt, you definitely need iodine. Um, and it's required nutrient, and not having it 
in the case of pregnant women leads to terribly deficient uh, mental capabilities of babies. Uh, and in adults, it leads to possibly low thyroid, which means low energy and not a good thing at all. If you eat iodized salt, no problem. You're probably getting enough. If you don't, you should throw some seaweed into your diet somewhere. Um, you could, you know, wrap up some rice in it and put some avocado and nuts in it and call it a sushi. Um, there's hijiki and wakame and all kinds of different tasting seaweeds that are really good sources of iodine. It's really difficult to find iodine in any land-based plant because it, it's been washed into the sea eons ago and that's pretty much where iodine now lives is in the sea. So if you don't eat fish then you're going to need to eat some seaweed to get your iodine or take it in a multiple vitamin. That's another way to get it. What about fish oil pills? Fish oil pills probably wouldn't supply you with iodine actually. Um, last night I talked a lot about fish oil and even though it's not really in this talk uh, I'll mention briefly that in our bodies we can take the essential fatty acid ALA and el enlarge it. We can elongate it and desaturate it into EPA, which is the fish oil, eicosapentaenoic acid, the fish oil fatty acid that we need. Also DHA is another one. We can either do that inside our bodies, inside our bodies, or we can do it by taking in the fish oil directly. Now, if we do it in our bodies, that's really the best way. Uh, but to do it in our bodies, we need to have not too much of the other essential fatty acid, which is very common to have too much. And we need enough ALA to begin with, the hard to get essential fatty acid, which isn't very common either. So for instance, if you eat a handful of walnuts a day or add a tablespoon of flaxseed freshly ground into your salads or smoothies, this would be one way to boost your ALA. And restricting your intake of liquid oils would restrict your LA. This would really help your body to make all the EPA and DHA it needs. And this is what I'd recommend. Why? Well, if you take EPA from fish oil, first of all, the fish are very toxic. It's usually gotten from farmed salmon. 95% of the salmon now is farmed. So the farmed salmon have terrible pollution problems. And this is largely because they take the slaughterhouse waste and they feed it to the fish in the fish pens. And the slaughterhouse waste already has biomagnified pesticides and other environmental toxins like PCBs concentrated. Then they feed it to the fish and they concentrate it further into the oil. These are lipophilic or oil-loving chemicals. So one big problem with fish oils is the chemicals in it. This is not a good thing. Mercury, too, is often found in fish oils and it's very, very toxic not a nutritional mineral at all. Another problem is if you take EPA from a fish oil source, it'll increase your bleeding tendencies. May not be a big problem. But another problem is that if you take EPA capsules, this is true whether it's from fish oil or algae EPA, it will depress your immune system. Your body will be less capable of policing cancer cells and stopping infections. And this is a good reason not to take EPA. In fact, fish oil is contraindicated in the elderly because it would kill so many elderly from infectious diseases if they took it. And this is because the eicosanoids, specifically the leukotrienes made from EPA, are about 30 times less powerful than they would be if made from arachidonic acid. So by shifting your body's balance over to EPA by taking fish oil, you're actually depressing your immune system and your ability to react to infection and inflammation. And um, that's the short version. <laughs> okay, in the back. Well, that, uh, you were saying, you know, increase uh, your diet with a little flaxseed or walnut, and then you said to restrict other oils. What yeah, the linoleic acid is an essential fatty acid, but everybody gets too much, not too little. Mm -hmm. And that's found, for instance, in liquid oils. So it, instead of chug-a-lugging your salad dressing on full of liquid oil, it would be really better to um, you know, make a quick avocado dressing or dressing in a blender with some nuts and seeds, or buy a tahini dressing that's based on tahini rather than oils, if you can find a good one. Um, so that, that would help restrict the amount of linoleic acid that you're taking in. And that really makes a difference in boosting your internal production of EPA is really important. Does olive oil fall into that bad oil? Uh, olive oil is about 14 to 1 and desirable is about 3 to 1, so it's not really very helpful. 
Uh, canola oil, if cold pressed and organic, or soybean oil, if cold pressed and organic, would be actually quite beneficial for that ratio. They're three to one and four to one, um, just about perfect. Um, so this is just a little chart. You need trivalent chromium in order to get glucose out of your bloodstream and into your cells. It's greatly enhanced if that's available. So chromium's available, for instance, in nutritional yeast, and there aren't that many other sources, but broccoli and green beans and grape juice are some of the other sources of that one. So I want to talk about strong bones for a minute. Uh, in elderly folks, nobody knows. You know, all of these diseases, they have no symptoms. Heart disease, you could walk around right up until a heart attack and never feel anything, and then drop dead. With diabetes, you have no symptoms until you go to a hospital and they have to start taking off body parts. So many of these diseases, osteoporosis also has no symptoms until somebody falls down and breaks a hip. And that's, or a leg or an arm or whatever. So you basically should have it checked maybe once or twice in your life to make sure your bones are strong. Um, the beta carotene in fruits and vegetables doesn't hurt your bones, but the preformed types of vitamin A do hurt your bones and make them weaker. Uh, men get it too, but it's mostly women. You can see that the bones normally are dense and with osteoporosis they're more hollow. Now exercise makes a huge difference. If you work them out, your bones will strengthen. Every time you push down on a bone, a little electrical charge goes through it that makes the crystals grow denser. So that's part of it. If they're testing your arm, for uh, osteoporosis, which is real common, kind of cheapy test. Well, that works, but if you don't use your arms much, it doesn't work at all. So if somebody's a baseball player, their arms are going to look great, but if they're a computer typist, they, probably their arms will look weak. And uh, like if you sprain an ankle, just over the course of a year, your ankle that's sprained, that, those bones will hollow out and look bad. And over the course of the next year, as you start walking on it, they'll re firm themselves up. They'll get more dense. Um, vitamin D is really important for strong bones. Vitamin D in the form of sunlight shines on your skin and a form of cholesterol is changed into cholecalciferol. This is the D3 form of vitamin D. That goes into the liver where it's stored as calcidiol. But calcidiol, although it's the circulating form and the form that doctors measure to find out your levels, doesn't do anything. Calcidiol has to be transformed either in the kidneys or other tissues to either fight cancer or in the case of the, the kidneys, the calcitriol is the active form and it boosts your calcium and phosphorus levels and makes your bones harder. So vitamin D is essential. If there's any doubt, you probably should take a vitamin D supplement. And the question is, should you take D2, which is vegan, or D3, which is made out of lanolin from sheep's wool, which may be vegetarian but not quite vegan because it inconveniences the sheep to get their, their wool sheared off every spring. I'll have to leave that up to you, but the D3 is a much better form from a physical standpoint. Um, D2 is adequate if you need to take a little more and a little more frequently. So for instance, if your multiple has D2 in it and it's got enough, that should be fine. Um, not a big problem. Vitamin K is really needed for strong bones. And this seems to be ignored by most people who talk about <coughs> strong bones. What foods is vitamin K found in? It's a really easy question. It's right <laughs> behind me. Um, spinach, green leafies, that's where you find vitamin K. And um, vitamin K is a real interesting vitamin. It was named after the Swedish or German word for coagulation. It's used in coagulation of the blood. Um, you've got to have it. That means you need to eat your green leafy vegetables. Uh, otherwise, your bones won't be able, the, the glutamine residues won't be able to attach calcium and phosphorus to your bones on a technical level. On the other level, you just plain need it. Magnesium, you need it. If you're low in magnesium, your bones may be dense, but they'll be brittle anyway. And this is one of the problems with a bone density scan, whether it's x-ray or ultrasound, is that the bones look dense, but they're fragile and easy to break. And this is a good reason to eat a lot of leafy green vegetables. Now, one thing that most people don't talk about and I really think is important is that all this packaged food that we eat has tons of salt in it. Other forms of sodium. For instance, bread is very high in sodium. 
80% of your sodium intake is from packaged foods. 10% from adding it in the kitchen and 10% from shaking it on your food. So I say don't worry about shaking salt on your food. If you feel like salt, if it tastes good, fine. But try not to eat packaged foods because the typical amount of extra salt that Americans get depletes 287 milligrams daily from your bones if you're not getting enough calcium. Or instead of your intake needing to be 1,200 a day, then you would need to have 1,500 a day just to account for the amounts lost with all that extra salt. Now how else can you get calcium out of your bones? Excess protein. This, this little guy's thinking about this. Excess protein can definitely leach out and uh, a high protein diet, 130 grams extra, which is very common in an American diet. Basically, what do you need to eat to get a high protein diet? Meat. Now, nuts won't really do it. They're too fatty and people just don't eat enough. You really need to eat either meat or cheese. Those are pretty much the ones. Chicken or fish will do it too. They'll definitely kick it way up like this. If you're eating that much, you're going to need another 750 milligrams of calcium every day. If you don't get it, your body will pull that out of your bones. And this is much more important, the depletion of the calcium in the bones, than it is eating calcium in your diet. These are big numbers. Just the salt and the protein alone make up almost as much as you need in a day to begin with. So by becoming vegan and not eating packaged foods because you want to become a whole foods vegan, then you're going to wind up not needing all this extra calcium and your bones are going to be rock solid and strong. Now if you're pregnant, you really need to keep your folate intake up. Green leafy vegetables will do it because you don't want neural tube defects. Calcium is needed. Obviously, do you need milk to get calcium? No. You really don't. And I think it's interesting that the countries with the highest dairy product intake have the highest rates of osteoporosis. So it's not, it is true that dairy products have a lot of calcium. They also have a lot of protein, and in the case of cheese, a lot of salt, very much salt, that depletes the calcium from your bones. So it's not all a good thing. And the extra protein in the dairy products is also a problem with, with bones. Iron deficiency is extremely common in pregnant women. In fact, in the last trimester, no diet can supply enough. I recommend supplements. Um, there's a liquid supplement called Floridex, really nice for the last trimester of a woman's uh, time. So she doesn't deplete her own iron stores. And then there's zinc. If you're taking iron supplements, which most women are prescribed 60 milligrams of, okay, a poorly absorbed form of iron, but they need to take zinc along with it, otherwise the iron will deplete their zinc. And then last but not least, iodine's really needed by pregnant women because even just a slight deficiency in iodine will reduce the IQ of the baby dramatically. So everybody should be getting their, their iodine. Now, you know, I don't think I did get to B12, and I do want to answer that. Um, B12 is made by bacteria and it's concentrated in meat products. Now, people who are vegan don't eat any meat products, any animal products, so they don't get any B12 in their diets. We do make a little in our intestines and a healthy intestine can make some and there are transport functions to get it into the bloodstream from the intestines. But I would not rely upon that in order to get enough B12. Why? Because B12 deficiency is nasty. It causes terrible nerve degeneration and really you don't want to mess with it. I've seen people with B12 deficiency, long-term vegans. And so if you're a vegan, you really need to take a B12 supplement. What if you're not a vegan? What if you eat meat all the time and you get lots of B12? Well, in this case, it's very likely because meat has no fiber that your digestion will not be very good. Your digestion will be sluggish. People who eat either meat or dairy products or fish or chicken have a large chunk of fatty stuff that has no fiber and our digestion is not designed for that. We really need the fiber in food. So that means that the, the mucus layers of the intestines are messed up and B12 is very hard to absorb. So anybody who eats meat and chicken and fish and, or any other diet needs B12 too because they're not likely to absorb it. So they're going to need sublingual B12 even more. Yes, wait. Well, I was just curious, especially about the uh, prehistoric diets that were largely plant-based. My understanding is that B12 was gotten from, you know, 
food that was not washed so well, and so and now we have hyper clean soil. That seems to be the theory. That's one theory. The other is that humans do make B12 in, in their intestines, and it's possible that they might have made enough with uh, a really healthy diet, and then the contaminating bacteria that aren't you know washed off in the non chlorinated water would provide enough B12. We only need two and a half micrograms of B12 a day. I mean, literally, we'll fit not on the head of a pin, but on the tip of a pin with lots of room left over. So we need this tiny, tiny amount of B12, and we store it for long periods of time. So it's only vegans usually after five or 10 years that start running into B12 deficiencies. If there's one supplement I think everyone should take, that would be B12. Now, I want to talk about um, uh, vitamin E and heart disease. Well, we've all heard a lot about it. Here's a study that showed that people who took vitamin E had a lot lower incidence of heart attacks, 40% lower. Uh, here's another study, and in this incident, this study, they found important reduction of heart attacks in patients with coronary artery disease. So in this study, taking supplements really helped. But in general, the studies on vitamin E as supplements and heart attacks is not that conclusive. Now, in contrast, vitamin E in food is absolutely surely associated with lower incidence of heart disease. So if you took your vitamin E supplement as an almond or a sunflower seed, you'd be doing really good. Then you would get the type of vitamin E that is sure to help your heart attack. Why is this off? Why don't the supplements work? They should work. Vitamin E really does prevent heart attacks. Why don't these supplements do it? Well, there's three reasons. One is that they're using a synthetic form that doesn't look anything like the natural form. The all racemic forms used in almost all of these studies, first of all, are only the alpha tocopherol fraction. There are four, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. And they're only using the alpha fraction, and then they're using this weird synthetic form that only has one, only one eighth of it is natural. The other seven eighths are not. And all of these S forms are completely worthless. So when your liver is loading this vitamin E to protect the LDL and its passage through your bloodstream, to protect it from damaging your arteries, it could be loading on this worthless form. And if it does that, it's not going to protect your arteries. So this is a real problem that they're giving patients the wrong form. Why? Because these doctors never learned about vitamins in school. That's the problem. The ones doing these tests, and I hate to say it, some of them are probably paid with grants by pharmaceutical companies to prove that vitamin E doesn't work. Because after all, you can't patent it and you can't make a lot of money on it. And I'm sorry to say, but biomedical research is highly slanted by funding. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of studies showing this, and it's certainly a fact. And the first thing I do when I read a medical article is go to the bottom and look at the affiliations of the authors. And if it's an article about saturated fat and the authors work for the Australian beef and cattle industry, <laughs> I'm really going to read it with a jaundiced eye and, and interpret what it says. Um, Another reason why these supplements don't work is the gamma form of vitamin E. The one that's abundantly found in food is one that deagglutinates our blood and allows it to flow smoothly so that blood clots don't kill us. This is really important, but when you take only alpha and no gamma, which is the case in almost all of these studies, then your blood becomes thicker because of lack of gamma tocopherol, another form of vitamin E. And the third reason is that they often don't supplement with vitamin C. And vitamin E, when it's implanted in the LDL, it can kill one free radical off. It can neutralize it, and then it's out of bullets. But if you have vitamin C, it comes in and recharges it. It can go and, and then neutralize another free radical. And then vitamin C can recharge it again and again and again. So these studies need to be done over again. And I think you'll find that if your vitamin E is the mixed tocopherol, not just the alpha, the natural form, and not the synthetic all racemic. And if you add vitamin C to it, then you'll see the studies starting to show a tremendous help if they're given an adequate amount to heart disease. Here's vitamin E, this little white guy here. It's stuck in the cell membrane. And when one of these phospholipids with the little wiggly tails, sorry, they're hard to see here. When one of those becomes attacked by a free radical, it actually bends up to the surface and gets neutralized by the vitamin E head. And then it goes back fixed back down into the cell. It's, it's pretty cool the way this is done. And then vitamin C comes along in the bloodstream and recharges the vitamin E. So all of our 100 trillion cells have this membrane around them 
that is protected with vitamin E and it is a crucial nutrient. Almonds, hazelnuts are really good sources of alpha tocopherol. Um, sunflower seeds are one of the best too. And the gamma tocopherol is also really important. You find that in avocados, canola oil, and lots of other foods. So the idea is to get your vitamin E from whole nuts and seeds and from a few of the oils that are maybe still cold pressed enough to have some E left in them. Here's vitamin B12. I knew it would come along here. Um, it's really hard to absorb. It's tricky stuff. It's bound to a protein to begin with and then it goes in the stomach and the protein gets taken off. It has to get stuck on intrinsic factor. But a lot of Americans, because their diet is not correct for their stomachs, in other words, they're not vegans, their stomachs don't work very well and the intrinsic factor can't be produced. And then this is very difficult to absorb. Once it's absorbed, it needs that. Now here's a fun thing about B12. Microwave cooking largely inactivates B12. Now how many meat eaters nuke their food? But pretty much all of them. Right? I mean, and if you barbecue it, then you're getting all these carcinogenic compounds on it and nuking it, you're killing off your B12. So that's why I say everybody should probably take B12 because it, it's so common now for restaurant food to be microwaved and it's so common for people in their houses because of convenience and microwave cooking preserves almost all the other vitamins really well. But B12, it damages it so it's no longer biologically active. I think we did it. <laughs> this is our boat sojourn at anchor in the Sea of Cortez. My wife and I had the luxury to sail for six years on sojourn and I wrote healing medicine and several of my herbal databases while we were sailing. And uh, so I want to thank you very much for your attention. You've been a lovely audience and uh, we'll have some questions now in just a minute. Thank you. Ah, that's my pay. <laughs> Talk about pesticides affecting fish oil. Would you say that organic foods and vegetables are better than pesticide laden ones? Not just from a. No, I think it's better to have the pesticide sprayed right on the fruits and vegetables. Yeah. What? So I mean. <laughs> how, how does that affect the vitamins and minerals getting to us? Is there a complete, does something happen to that? Well, one of the things that's different between organic farming and commercial farming is that in organic farming, they're adding like rock dust and other minerals to the soil so the soil is properly mineralized. And the plants don't make the minerals, they absorb them from the soil. So properly mineralized soil is very important. Um, zinc and selenium are depleted in many of the states. And many agricultural pr products don't have much zinc or selenium anymore because they've been pulled out of the soil. And what do they add? NPK. And then they grow more plants and they pull all the minerals out. And they do that over and over and the soils become depleted. So organic food is better that way. And it's not so much the pesticides in fish, mostly just DDT and its breakdown product DDE, but polychlorinated biphenyls, the PCBs are industrial pollutants that seem to concentrate in fish oils. And mercury's a big one too. So um, the algal kind will have less of these problems, but still, I'm, I'm not, boy, you're gonna think I don't like EPA capsules at all. Uh, the problem is these are the most fragile fatty acids on the face of the earth. They have five and six double bonds and they just break down so easily and become rancid that there's no chance that your fish oil capsules won't be rancid. Just none at all. I mean, after all, they produce the oil through a great deal of heat to get it out of the fish. So, sorry about that. Thanks. Good night. Uh, yes? You mentioned earlier we were talking about the difference between cooking food and raw that a lot of the nutrients are lost just through leaching. Mm -hmm. How much is lost just from the heat itself? Well, it varies by nutrient. Um, heat doesn't break down too many of the nutrients like steam heat. Uh, when you get into high, high heat frying, it, it kills more. But I'm always impressed that, yeah, there's a lot left. And with um, my diet doctor, you can go ahead and look at raw spinach and cooked spinach. And you can just go ahead and put 100 grams of each in and see how much vitamin A and how much of this and that B vitamin or mineral are left in it. And people often exaggerate that. Now, I am a big believer in raw food. I feel that when I eat a lot of raw food, like half my diet is raw, I have more energy. I'm certainly leaner. 
I feel like my brain works better. It, it just, it really feels good in my body to eat a lot of fresh fruit and fresh vegetables. And I don't know exactly why that is, but it's not just the plain old nutrients because they don't come out that different. And then again, you can eat so much more of a cooked vegetable than a, a fresh one that you're actually getting more nutrients from the cooked vegetable because you're eating two or three or four times as much of it. Even if it's depleted by 25 or 50 percent, you're still getting more. So those are, those are some ideas there. I encourage everyone to analyze their diet. I'll give you a huge discount. We just have a few of these left. One of my projects that's been a lot of fun, since I have you all captivated here, uh, is this, the uh, herb doctors. For 27 years, I've been researching herbs and other natural remedies used throughout the world. And this little fun graphic here has little black dots over all of the continents. Each one of those represents books that I have personally read and entered into this database, hundreds of them from 54 countries and regions around the world. So that you have a place if you want something for a migraine headache or any of 6,600 unique conditions, I mean it really covers practically everything that can go wrong with the human body, you can find out not only what's used by one herbalist, but cross-correlate with all of them. So you'll find for migraine what most of the herb doctors of the world use for it. Where they agree the most is at the top of the list. You know, there might be a hundred different herbs used for migraine around the world, but at the top of the list will be one that's used by most of them. So this has been a really fun project, a really huge one. Just this year I added 4,800 pages of information, 40,000 new facts, footnoted facts. And it was a very small increase. Went from 128,000 footnoted facts to 168,000 footnoted facts. That, uh, Healing Medicine is a book that I, I wrote in response to so many stories about medical care. And this book is about how medical care should be. It should be healing, not poisoning. And it's also about, it should help us to heal. And most drugs and most surgeries don't really help us to heal. Instead, they may hide symptoms, or they may actually cause symptoms. So I, I wrote this book, and it's written in simple language with big thoughts uh, about how you can become disease-proof. See, what other fun, fun things have I done? I have six movies, like if you wanted to know about choosing supplements, this movie is a little $15 movie that talks all about how to pick supplements. And really, you know, I hear about doctors and dietitians say all supplements are bad. And you know, they're mostly right. And health food store owners and a lot of natural people will say, oh, supplements are all great. And they're mostly wrong because most supplements really aren't very good. Most of the calcium supplements are only 3% absorbable. If you need 1,200 milligrams a day and you take 1,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate and it's 3% absorbable, you're only getting 30 milligrams contributed toward your 1,200 milligram need. That's nothing. It's worthless. So in that case, the doctors are really right. If you're taking a calcium ascorbate or a calcium orotate or even a calcium citrate, you're going to get a much higher absorption rate and it really will help you. And like I told you about vitamin E. 99% of the vitamin E sold is not only not good for you, it's probably a little tiny bit bad for you. So you do need to be careful in choosing your supplements. So I would encourage you to do that and not just blithely say that, oh, this one's at Costco and it's cheap, I'll buy it. Or even go into a health food store and say, well, it's a health food store, all these vitamins are good. They're not. There's really a huge difference between. A question in the back? Do you have a B12 supplement that you would recommend a brand? You know, they're not that different. Uh, cobalamin can either be cyanocobalamin or methylcobalamin. It doesn't really matter at all. It's all broken apart in the stomach uh, into cobalamin and then intrinsic factor and absorbed. Just any sublingual, I'd recommend one without folic acid. And they're easy to find. They're cheap. They're completely non-toxic. And they're a reasonable precaution in preventive medicine to stop you from getting this terrible nerve degeneration that can happen whether you eat meat or don't eat meat. It really doesn't matter. We have, yes? Um, I just started three days ago. Well, I've been putting off going to the doctor for like the last year because I have, uh, I don't know if it's acid reflux or what it is, but I've been trying to change my diet myself and blah, 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 blah. So I finally got so miserable three days ago, I broke down, went down, talked to the pharmacist and just did a generic over-the-counter, it's uh, magnesium, 
Oh, yeah. Omeprazole. Like milk of magnesium? No, it's, it's a pill, it's a capsule, but it says it has magnesium in it. So now hearing this, does that mean I'm getting some benefit because it has magnesium in it? Or, I mean, it's a drug. I still want you to eat green leafy vegetables. <laughs> but, but to help, the, to help, but it, I actually have gotten a little bit of relief now. This is the third day, you take it for 14 days. So I'm trying it before I actually go to the doctor because I know what the doctor's going to do. What's it's going to prescribe more, more Yeah, drugs. You know, they, they have some um, really nasty pills they're using now for acid reflux that are way too strong. Proton pump inhibitors, they're called. And if your doctor prescribes that one, I recommend that you research it carefully to see if it's really indicated because usually it's not. And it's, it's all too frequently prescribed because it works, but it has terrible side effects. So you might want to... Be careful of that one in case you do go get brave and go to the doctor. Just one more quickie question. Drinks. Yeah. Is that, are they bad for, for, I heard some, somebody tell me, oh, they're not good for our bones. Are, well, I mean, one of the things about carbonated drinks is they usually have, you know, about 12 teaspoons of sugar in them well, or high fructose corn syrup. Anything that's carbonated. If they don't have sugar in them, people probably aren't going to drink them. What, you mean like a that's mineral like water, like a Perrier? Yeah, yeah, like mineral water. Oh, I don't think there's anything wrong with so a Perrier. The itself is not. I don't think it's that big a deal. It's carbon dioxide. You know, it's not really a desirable thing, but most of it bubbles out before you drink it anyway. And it... It comes out of your, your lungs, you know, quite, quite easily. It's all the sugar and high fructose corn syrup and the phosphoric acid in most of these things that's causing the trouble. And the phosphoric acid could contribute to bone depletion in, say, Coca-Cola. However, Coca-Cola is excellent for cleaning the white crud off your battery terminals. I mean, it's amazing. It's like magic. You just pour it on, it bubbles a little bit, and all the white crud's off your terminals. It's a great acid for that. Okay, any other questions about car terminals or health? <laughs> look in my book. I've got the RDAs for kids You just by age group and you can check that. Um, you know, it's really a tiny bit and luckily B12 is not toxic. So you don't have to be quite as careful with it. Also, B12 from supplements is very poorly absorbed. So my sublingual, for instance, is 500 mi micrograms. Okay, I need 2.4 a day. Why am I taking 500 micrograms? First of all, I only take them once or twice a week. And second of all, you only absorb about one one hundredth of the B12 you take. It's one of our protection mechanisms so we don't get too much. So really, absorption's quite low and your body regulates it and stores it. So you can get rid of it, yeah. Um, what would you consider to be a good breakfast? Ah, good breakfast. <laughs> um, well, what we do at home is we have some form of oats. Like we may take rolled oats and soak them for 24 hours. And then they come off like they're cooked already, but somehow I like them better than cooked. They don't have that kind of burnt smell. And then we would take that and add to that about four, four times as much fresh fruit. And um, then maybe a handful of nuts or two. And I'd consider that a really great breakfast. Soaked in what? Soaked in water. Yeah, uh, two to one. My wife has a book. Is, is that in there? Yes, it is. OK, Moosely it's called in Europe. It's quite widely used. It's soaked oats instead of cooked oats. And it seems to be a little easier to digest and a little more pleasant to eat. I like it better. Um, you can also cook your rolled oats or, you know, you need some kind of grain in the morning along with the fruit because otherwise the fruit will burn off so quick you'll be hungry before. And the nuts help with hunger too. By having uh, either some ground nuts over the top um, or a handful of nuts a little bit later, you're getting a little broader based nutrition. So then you're getting all the, the fruits, you're getting some grains, and you're getting some nuts, and then hopefully you're going to eat lots of vegetables for lunch and dinner. So, I mean, this really varies by climate and preference and everything. Um, you know, maybe you like strawberry waffles with whipped cream. I don't know. It, it just depends. <laughs> <laughs> yes? There's a liquid uh, trace mineral um, supplement, I guess. Mm -hmm. Would you say that it's probably not? absorbs very well and that food would be the best for me. Well, I think a liquid trace mineral supplement would probably be well absorbed. Um, there are different formulations um, of 
trace minerals, and they really, really vary. Um, some of the ones I like are from uh, Dead Sea minerals. Uh, they seem to be a little easier to absorb and a little more chelated. The best way would be to take those and put it in your compost and grow your food with it and then eat the food. Um, because once they're complexed in food, they're really perfect for us to absorb. And that's the way we are. Maybe I'll, I'll close off the questions because it's starting to get late. If anyone would like to get a book or a movie or hopefully analyze their diet, um, please come on up and uh, you can ask me questions too. But this way other people can go home who have sleepy little girls. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Very nice.